fantastic creative team so I have Sarah Greenwood who's entire production design who's done an amazing job it's such a fantastic story and it's so kind of brilliantly English you know the, the combination of Guy Ritchie and Sherlock Holmes you know I just thought well fantastic that'll be a completely different approach you know his thing is he doesn't come in pretending that he knows everything about period and so he listens and he wants it to be authentic she was very determined to try and get um, scale to the movie. It's quite a big challenge because we had quite a short period to um, prepare the movie. My first impression when I read the script was, you know, it's like this cannot be, this cannot be real. In you know, we had 11 weeks prep. It was a real challenge to achieve what we've achieved in the time that we had. What we've done is we've gone back to what are undoubtedly fantastic stories in a fascinating uh, period, Victorian London, which was seedy and menacing and dark and full of theatre and drama and we've looked at the qualities of these stories that perhaps haven't yet been uh, investigated. Okay, we'll go one more time everybody. Excellent, thank you. Oh, I see two men, brothers, oh, not in blood but in bond. Period should not be all but period is what gives it its context and its rationale and so as far as the interior of Baker Street even though it would have started life as a relatively conventional kind of lower middle class house it was decorated maybe 20 years 30 years ago it's gone slightly tatty you know and then Holmes has come in and basically he's screwed with it he's completely messed it up it is not a conventional Victorian parlour at all. It's it's the antithesis of that. You know, this is this is what would drive Mrs. Hudson completely mad. So here we have a beautiful William IV sideboard, which would probably, you know, be worth tens of thousands of pounds in our day, not in her day. It would have been an out of fashion piece of furniture, but certainly it would not Mrs. Hudson would not be happy that Holmes is using it for his experimentation. All this is actually heavily researched but pulled together in quite a hurry because we were running out of time, we were doing all the other sets as well. Mm -hmm. But we sort of gathered all the smalls as we went along from like flea markets, antique shops, and hire companies. So it's a real sort of mass mix, really. A lot of the film was shot outside of London to try and get sort of Victorian cameos, which we could then patch together to create our Victorian London. And it was great having the freedom to go to places like Manchester and Liverpool, but to shoot the old dockside in Liverpool was fantastic, you know, because it's there and it's kind of, it's on its last knock, you know, it's literally penciled for conversion in the next, you know, 12 months or so. So it was really great to be able to use those, ex you know, incredible buildings and things. Every other day, we're in a completely new location and uh, they've built us docks, they've built us factories, they've built us boats. You turn up and something's happened. The work that we did at Chatham on the shipyard, you could not have done in the studio, not at that scale. It's just a sheer scale we were able to achieve outside. But I think the main contrasts in the film are within the exteriors and the interiors. So the interiors, you know, have a jewel-like quality and then, you know, the monochromaticness, which is to a certain extent what London was like. He will use whatever you give him, which is great, you know, it's fantastic and also see things in a slightly different way. We are in Somerset House, which used to be some old Tudor palace in the middle of London. In fact, up and down here, you've got all the old tombstones that line the walls. So we are more or less in the basement of uh, Somerset House. Um, and here, this is replicating Blackwood's cell. And it works perfectly for uh, the uh, prison sequence. And also, because there's this enormous pathway that goes all the way around, so we can use it for the chase sequence in the beginning for the second unit. So it kills a couple of birds with one stone. You really feel London and you feel the characters and you feel the, the life at that time. And it was a it was an elegant time and a seedy time and it was a weird time. I love the contrast, I really do. I think, you know, from the grimness of this and the, you know, and Reardon's and everything to the grandness of, you know, the Grand Hotel or the Royal. So it was a, it kept you on your toe, it really did. And otherwise so you didn't get bored, you keep fresh and you accumulate knowledge at such a rapid pace because you have to. It does tick all the boxes. It does say this is Sherlock Holmes in this right period, but it also says that this is something, you know, very funny, fast-paced, fast-moving, and powerful. There's something very powerful about it, and uh, that's what I've not seen in a film of this period.
It was black and white, it was on TV. The deerstalker cap and the pipe and the elementary, my dear Watson. A deerstalker hat and an Inverness cape. He became sort of the quintessential lofty toff. And uh, what we've tried to do is take him back to what we believe to be his origin, which was essentially a more visceral character. I kept coming back to the same thing, and it was just these particular garments, and one is the black cord jacket, which what I loved about that was it had a flavor of the 1970s rock bands, and the tartan coat also I seem to have seen on some Rolling Stones album. We're actually going back and kind of staying truer to Conan Doyle's vision of Sherlock Holmes. We've tried to um essentially make him a more streetwise character, um, although he's quite lofty and tofty still. He's a guy that can manage to percolate all the different echelons of English society, which were tremendously complex. See his walking stick of rare, African snake would hide in the blue. It's not an old school adaptation of the book, so I don't think there's a deer stalker or a magnifying glass in sight. In recreating Sherlock Holmes, you see that he was a martial artist, that he was even stranger than could be imagined. He had this variety of interests. Plays violin, plays piano, is just very adept at so many things. He almost looks like a sort of Victorian Cambridge Don, you know? Old school, disheveled, because his mind is so busy he hasn't got time to think about his appearance. To me, that makes much more sense. London's so bleak this time of year. Not that I'm pining for New Jersey. It's interesting in bringing a female character into a Sherlock Holmes story because Sherlock doesn't really have love interests per se, but there is one woman, and her name was Irene Adler. She really runs the gamut of clothing. It's like, you know, these massive bustles to these, you know, lovely tailored tweed suits. You know, they're always a little bit flamboyant, yet she somehow slips under the radar. Slightly awkward in one way because she's always in disguise and you shouldn't notice her, but that's an opportunity I couldn't quite miss, you know, was to give her really strong colour. And this woman is, she's totally different to the rest of London. The whole sense of that character and the incantation robes, they're a little bit heightened because they wore fairly plain sort of wizard's robe. So I felt we could sort of fly a little bit. The writers have come up with a wonderfully sort of arcane, evil counterpoint to Sherlock. I found all sorts of ways to Blackwood that were, in essence, absolutely truthful to the Victorian period and just slightly off. So the coat's a leather coat, slightly Nazi-ish. Rather odd fabric for the waistcoat, looks a bit visceral. What I wanted to bring and what I know Guy and Robert looked to me to bring was a yin, if you like, to his yang, you know what I mean? Stated that he saw for this character, although it's lovely to have a terribly handsome man, he just wanted him stronger, so in fact it was the stronger tweeds that seemed to work. But in essence, it's good suits, good strong English suits that a military man, you know, and a, and a medical man would have worn, with, with a, just a hint to Afghanistan. In the books, he had, was a soldier, had fought in Afghanistan, and was the, essentially the brawn to Sherlock's brains. With that military background in mind, I really wanted him to be in the middle and, and in fact sort of on the front line and sometimes tearing in ahead of Holmes and therefore in allowing Robert to be the slightly more wayward, eccentric, uh, dilettante, you know, which is Holmes. It just feels kind of real, so it's just, I just feel so fortunate. Really making me look good. But that's the thing is everybody is helping everybody put their best foot forward. And now, for me, there is no other Holmes. I mean, this Basil Rathbone character is something out of illustration from Punch or what have you. It's, it never existed. For me, this is Holmes, without a doubt. The idea of having Holmes be, of course, as smart as he is and as clever as he is, but still also be an action hero felt perfect. Most of it happens off screen in the stories, but it definitely happens. He's a single stick fighter, a master of the, uh, the strange art of Aritsu, bare knuckle boxer, all that stuff. It feels like a 1891 version of a Bond film. Sherlock actually knew martial arts. He was a fighter. He could do what he had to do. And Downey plays all those elements.
Sherlock Holmes who's the first martial artist uh, really in Western culture he studied something called Baritsu which actually is a form of jiu-jitsu did exist and so I thought wow this is fantastic we can we can use all this can you go for the old triangle yeah <laughs> Yeah. Jiu-Jitsu is Guy Ritchie's chosen martial art. Mine is Wing Chun Kung Fu. Well, Robert's been training in Wing Chun for the last five years, and he's good. He's very fast, very flexible. Initially, I thought I'd come in and just show Guy how badass Sifu and I were and how much we were going to contribute to the choreography, which we did. But on the very first day, he had me tie some guy up like a pretzel and choke him out with his own jacket and we all just kind of stood there watching while he demonstrated how he would eviscerate his foe. <laughs> We've tried to integrate Sherlock Holmes into a sort of street level. We've tried to um, essentially make him a more streetwise character. Well, Baritsu is a bastardization of um, Bartitsu, which was the English guy Barton who went to Japan and studied jujitsu. But because Doyle doesn't call it Bartitsu, which locked us into Barton's jujitsu, it actually is this kind of, you know, nebulous thing that we were able to create. So it's a combination of um, Guy's style and my style. When it comes to Holmes' fighting skill, that's where his gentlemanness comes out. We don't want to oppose force on force, but rather flow around it or through it and utilize their energy against them. But ultimately, as much as possible, yeah, we want to keep that energy flowing forward, 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 forward. And when you hit a, an obstacle or a wall, then you flow around and keep coming. The idea behind the punch bowl sequence was uh, that it's like his lab. It's where he goes to experiment and trial and error and make mistakes. So he's using sort of pressure points, how he's getting in to, to block the punches from the other guy. So you have to be able to see the larger picture, make sure that punch or that strike doesn't land its mark, and in turn, simultaneously go after the opening that has been exposed by the attack itself. Basically, we've been doing as sort of safely as we can full contact fighting. So there's some great shots there. Every hit you see him take is absolutely real, and the the action they accomplished on that I thought was was really quite extraordinary. He's very physical, and in fact, outdoes a lot of the stuntmen with his physicality. You could not think of a more perfect Holmes. I love being an American playing Sherlock Holmes in England. As long as the accent's all right, it's all gravy. Take us under the bridge, port side, approximately 100 yards beyond that, you'll find the mouth of a tunnel which leads us to the shoes. Right away, Ladies first. Sure. Robert Downey is uh, the perfect Holmes in my eyes because he's American for a start. I like the fact he's American, which sort of gives him an international feeling. But his English accent is actually perfect. I was lucky enough to do Chaplin with him and, and Restoration. And uh, so we set the groundwork, really, I suppose, not knowing that this would ever happen. I'm just different now, so I, I love language so much. And I love words before, though. I thought, I'm doing this accent, and then I just do my voice, which is, you know, the best voice that I'm aware of for me. Uh, Lady Ramsay uh, reports an emerald bracelet. Uh, Insurance swindle. Lord Ramsay likes fast women and slow ponies. <clears throat> Cut. The lovely thing about Robert is that he, he can do it off the cuff virtually. I mean, that, uh, and then I have to go in and say, well, you know, just do that, that, and and it's done. Uh, and uh, it's often to do with rhythm. It's uh, RP, received pronunciation. He who would hear and now know aught of the new art must fight, toil, care, learn, then take his ease. Phonetic alphabet type stuff. I don't know how many times 
I can say, ah, uh, crime scene photographer is what your constabulary requires. A photographer? Indeed. It is the future. That kind of gives uh, Holmes and Roberts' accent total authenticity. And often as an actor, you find that doing an accent can get in the way because everything you're thinking about is concerned with the sound of your accent. But he doesn't seem to have any problems with that whatsoever. We allow some changes to take place, but it's good to know where it ought to be, and then you can break those rules and use uh, modern terminology or modern phrasing uh, for effect. I need your help. I want you to find someone. <coughs> you, why, why? Careful. Why are you so suspicious? What shall I answer chronologically or alphabetically? And Andrew Jack has gotten me to the point where it's like, well, technique is just the price of admission. And then it's, what do you do with those? So I lean on him quite heavily when he'll tell me why a rising or lowering inflection changes entirely. And he is the expert, and I am the student. Ah, Joe Regan. I was the 15th most dangerous man in London. So, I'm uh, on fifth, sir. Yeah. Uh, working your way up. What are you in for this time? Piracy, is it? Piracy on the Thames. Piracy on the Thames. How romantic is it? <laughs> it's often just stressing, like, you know, I'd say, um, pick up the book. And he'd say, pick up the book. So he'll put the stress on up instead of pick, it, you know, like, like Americans do. Come in. You know, and we go, come in. That said, he'd noticed I've come a long way in my confidence, and he also said my voice is just much less grating to work with because now I'm in my 40s and it's dropped into my chest a little more. My goodness me. Here we are. Well, they should be able to give us an address. My goodness me. <laughs> what a coincidence. There's one thing about the watch you forgot to mention, Holmes. Yeah, you go again on that. Why right. sound like I'm doing an English accent at all? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. A little bit quite crisp every now and then. What is up here? Ah, mad to sign and put it again. Let's go to the pub. Yeah, yeah let's go to the pub. Sherlock Holmes, he's not that interested in women, uh, at least uh, on the surface. Uh, he's certainly not interested in marriage, and he's not interested in the typical kind of domestic relationship that Watson would want to have. He's a weirdo. He's not uh, asexual. It just seems like he says to Watson, you know, the fair sex is your department. I mean, he even says in one of the stories that he doesn't believe in love and that kind of emotion because it would interfere with his, with his process. I, I think he's too aware of the fact that it's uh, an investment and that he has sacrificed his potential enjoyment in said realm for a higher cause. Part of Lionel's original conceit was to bring Irene Adler into the story. And Irene is an interesting character because she actually didn't appear in a lot of the stories. I think maybe only one story, actually, Scandal in Bohemia. But she had a lasting impression on Holmes, and she was always called the woman. And it seemed logical to bring Irene back. They met once uh, in Scandal in Bohemia. I would suggest that maybe they met again. Uh, she broke his heart and now they meet again. And it's a totally unorthodox romance. And I even know it's a period in its style that I think the romance is quite, you know, modern at times. Is that the Maharaja's missing diamond? Or just a, another souvenir? Mm. You know, he's a cruel despot with a palace full of Let's not dwell on the past, shall we? So it's kind of a fun dynamic because you have a woman who's the only one who bested Holmes. And there's something about her that just drives him crazy, both in the good and the bad way. So it's kind of the perfect character to introduce to the mix. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that Irene was actually an American. She was born in New Jersey. In the original book, she's, I think she's an opera singer and she's also uh, sort of an adventuress. She's a woman who has various affairs with, with men. And I sort of went a step beyond and I imagined her as a sort of secret agent. They're both after the same thing, and they can't decide whether to fight each other or to make love. The movie itself seemed like it was going to be a lot of fun, and there's, you know, obviously lots of action. I love, you know, characters that are really physical, so she had that, Irene had that going for her. You know, Robert is like a superhero in disguise, and he's so collaborative and so funny and so cre incredibly creative, you know. 
really keeps you on your toes. And Rachel is incredible because she's so beautiful and she's so sweet, but, and this is what we're doing with Irene, and you push her, you're gonna see a real vicious side. I've had to find some sort of balance between, you know, the elegance that women had at that time and this fearless, um, reckless nature. She's definitely a real renegade, you know. She's she's playing in a man's world at this time. She comes across as incredibly sweet and, and lovely, but underneath it all, she's just uh, just terrible. What have we here? She literally just knifed a guy in the alley, and she just waltzes through with her roses and her beautiful dress and every hair in place, you know. She's got that snaky quality where you don't know if she'll kiss you or kill you. <laughs> She's, you know, somewhere in between. And I have so many weapons. I mean, I don't know where they all fit, but apparently I have, I, I can fit a knife, two guns, and a couple, a pair of handcuffs all in the suit with these two little pockets. <laughs> I'd always been a big fan of Sherlock Holmes since I was a kid, and I'd always believed that there was something in there that hadn't yet been done. So when I eventually became a producer and started my own company, the first thing I decided to tackle was Sherlock Holmes. The images I saw in my head were, as I read these books, were completely different from anything I'd seen in any of the previous movies. The more you look into Conan Doyle's book, such a rich character, such a rich world, and, and uh, he and Watson and even their nemeses are just, they're, um, they're such fleshed out folk. I didn't see him as the kind of buttoned up, I would say Edwardian gentleman. Sherlock is a much more sort of um, modern and bohemian and complex and interesting character. You know, Conan Doyle based Sherlock Holmes on a Scottish doctor who was supposed to be able to basically look at you and tell you what's wrong with you. So in a way, Sherlock is a man who thinks so quickly that he's able to look at you and uh, size you up. You're engaged. The ring has gone, but the lighter skin which once sat suggests you sent some time abroad wearing it proudly. What's very clear about Holmes, even in the Conan Doyle, is his humanity and his vulnerability as a person and all the issues that come with being a genius and his, how uncomfortable he is in the world. He's a bit of a weirdo and the, the things that get him off are the things that frustrate most people. And the things that annoy him to no foreseeable end are the things that most people would say, well, that's commonplace, that's just the way life is. Holmes is the kind of character who, you know, he does, he, he literally does spend, between cases when he's bored, he spends two weeks just lying there on the sofa. And he doesn't feel bad about it. He's a kind of he's got that kind of slacker mentality, as well as being very, very driven when he's on a case, which I thought was really interesting. And I hope that Watson holds his own pretty well in this movie. And uh, I think, in a way, he's the person we'd want to be in many ways. There was so much uncovered and so much unexplored in the character. Um, his sort of strict military training and background, um, and the fact that he dives headfirst into these very physical, combative, and dangerous scenarios with his partner in fighting crime, very willingly. You know, he's definitely a ladies' man in the books. He is the writer of the stories, and so you, just, just by virtue of that, you can see his level of intellect. So I think our conception of Watson is actually a much more accurate one, and I'm rather proud of that, than what we've seen before. How it started was that I've been fascinated by another side of the Victorian life, which is the occult. And of course, Conan Doyle was as well. He was a spiritualist. He got involved in all sorts of seances and stuff like that. So I came up with a story which involved the whole notion of sort of spiritualism and the occult and all that kind of stuff. In a way, in the same way as Hound of the Baskervilles, create a mystery where all this magic is presented and part of what Holmes has to figure out is, is it real magic or not? And if it's not, how do you, how do, you do it? You know, his power is his brain. You know, that's the, his power is that he's able to figure things out that nobody else can see. There's a line in the movies, how did you see that? He's, I was looking for it. I mean, it's that kind of ability that, that Holmes sees things that nobody else sees. Sherlock Holmes' insight into the human condition is quite extraordinary, and I'm sure that's 
know, I've been trying to figure out what, what it is about him that makes him so popular and why we all love him. And I think it's that ultimately. He's, he really understands uh, what makes people tick, I think, in the most modern way, in a way that applies to us as, uh, you know, today, as much as it did back in his day. I thought I was a Sherlock Holmes fan and knew a bit about it. I, I, I know nothing compared to these people. I mean, the, the, their knowledge, their expertise is, is quite extraordinary. And they meet up uh, on an annual basis uh, to sort of celebrate Sherlock Holmes. A lot of Sherlockians read the canon every year, or at least parts of it. They try to keep up. Well, there's so much detail yeah. in the canon, and when we have these gatherings, people are always, uh, somehow, there's quizzes, there's questions, and everyone's trying to outdo each other. I would like now to put you all in, in reading mode and, and listening mode, because I'd like to tell you the story, the real story, in the words of John Watson himself, of the giant rat of Sumatra. <laughs> I, I think if Conan Doyle were, were alive today, He'd be bewildered by what we do. I don't think that authors expect to be remembered 150 years after they were born. Most authors are lucky to be remembered 50 years. Conan Doyle is still with us. Basically, uh, Sherlock Holmes is the, the ultimate superhero in the sense that he's so very self-contained. He's always right. He is eccentric. He's odd but he's always rational. He understands the law, but more important perhaps, he understands justice. It appealed to the Victorians at the time and to modern audiences now. I think one of the reasons why Holmes remains a popular character for the big screen and the small screen now too, is that every generation seems to be able to find something in that character. Before Rathbone and Bruce came onto the scene as Holmes and Watson, Watson was always way down the cast list. He was never seen as a partner to Holmes in the, in the, in the way we now think of him. And it was Hollywood who saw that really there were a, a partnership. Got a magnificent job of obliterating Christopher Morley, who founded the Baker Street Irregulars, edited a selection of the original stories and he called it Holmes and Watson, a textbook of friendship. And that friendship is very important to the stories. They are great reading. There's no effort getting into them. Watson is the greatest narrator just about in the world because he doesn't expect anything of a reader and he writes in beautiful prose. Oh, I think Conan Doyle, like most writers, wanted to have interesting characters and people that you wouldn't expect what they were gonna do next. And so he was trying to find that, that mixture between true suspense and entertainment, which I think he kind of succeeded in better than almost anybody else. We are in a position with technology today and the kind of budget that we have to really recreate London as, as a character, but in a way that will feel like a real place. We wanted to make London a character. We wanted to show London in the end of the 19th century at its greatest glory and at its, its most depraved. Well, it was the empire at its height. It was uh, nasty, and the fog wasn't fog, it was smoke. And yet there's this sense of immense engagement in, um, in technologies of the near future, and the sense of wonderment. I mean, London was as vibrant as New York in the 1890s, and arguably more so, it was the center of the Industrial Revolution. It was at that period where they were doing things that were obscenely ambitious. By the nature of what this is, guys required to sort of step it up. The scope of this movie is much larger, both on a budget level, but just in terms of where we're shooting. Can you put a hand there? Sure. Put your hand there for a little bit of support. Um, you know, have a good puff. And then look at what it is that you've just ascended, and then you're off, and then the camera goes to. Okay, right. stand by to go again. What we've done so far gives us all the pointers. You know, this is, this is the feel of it, this is the look of it. Everything being photographic as opposed to painterly. So we wanted to show it, you know, and have it 
be a living, breathing thing. So we had to use visual effects because some of those elements don't exist anymore. Well, we have incredible locations in this movie. We want to really maximize it and then let our visual effects guys take over and, and bring it back in time. We did start in places that do exist and added to it and built on it and created just a whole size and scale of the city that you've never seen before. It's one of the joys of making film, and especially making film t in, in, in today's day and age when you know, we have bigger budgets, we have more uh, effects at our, our fingertips, and uh, we can really go back to London of 1891 and recreate it. The idea here, and one of the things Guy does bring to it, is you want a gritty reality to it. We still have a lot of fun with it, there's still a huge scope to it, but we wanted to feel like we're really in 1891. We didn't want to feel like we were on a sound stage. It just is a vast canvas. It's a huge looking and feeling movie. It has weight to it, and it has scale and size and panorama. Mm -hmm.